This is a drawing of Srinivasa Ramanujan, a mathematical genius, and this is a problem he posed about a sum of radicals. In this video, we'll solve Ramanujan's problem. For his problem, a decimal approximation is not good enough. Ramanujan asked for an exact answer in this form. The question marks are whole numbers we have to fill in. How did Ramanujan come up with such a crazy answer, with one cube root inside another? And what whole numbers should replace the question marks? To find out, we may need to think like Ramanujan. But first, some background. Srinivasa Ramanujan was born in India, where he showed great mathematical promise. So he was invited to England to work with its top mathematicians. In his five years there, he amazed the math world with his remarkable discoveries. Since then, many books have been written about Ramanujan, and movies, focusing on his time in England. But before he became famous, before he traveled to England, Ramanujan was actively doing math on his own in India. We have his notebooks from that period containing thousands of results. He also posed dozens of problems in the Journal of the Indian Math Society, challenging its readers to solve them. Here is one such challenge published just before Ramanujan left India. It has two parts. We'll focus on the second part. This problem gives the angles in radians. Since pi radians is 180 degrees, we can convert the angles to degrees like this. So we end up with the same problem we started with. The cube root of the cosine of 40 degrees plus the cube root of the cosine of 80 degrees plus the cube root of the cosine of 160 degrees. Where shall we begin? When we first learn trigonometry, it's about triangles, but later we learn it's even more about circles. So let's draw these angles on a circle. Here's a standard unit circle with radius 1 centered at the origin. Starting with 0 degrees on the right, we rotate counterclockwise to get the angles 40 degrees, 80 degrees, and 160 degrees. What does cosine have to do with the circle? Cosine is the x-coordinate on the unit circle, so we'll drop down to the x-axis. Two of the cosines are positive, and the third is negative near minus 1. We can use a calculator to find decimal approximations of these cosines. Then we can estimate the sum of the cube roots of these cosines. So whatever exact answer we come up with better be around 0.49. Now what do we know about the angles 40, 80, and 160 degrees? There are other more common angles we know. I'll call those common angles friendly because we know their sines and cosines. From that point of view, 40, 80, and 160 degrees are not friendly. But what about their multiples? For instance, 3 times 40 degrees is 120 degrees, which is friendly. And 3 times 80 degrees is 240 degrees, also friendly. Finally, 3 times 160 degrees is 480 degrees, which wraps around the circle, ending at 120 degrees, again friendly. This observation gives us something to work with. To do so, we'll need a connection between cosine of an angle and cosine of triple the angle. Is there such a connection? Yes. You may have learned about the double angle formula. Similarly, there's a triple angle formula. Notice that the right side is a cubic in the cosine of theta. Let's use that formula for our angles. To start, set theta to 40 degrees. What's the cosine of 120 degrees? It's negative 1 half. Moving everything to one side and dividing by 4 gives the following. In other words, the cosine of 40 degrees is a root of the cubic polynomial x cubed minus 3 fourths x plus 1 eighth. We've discovered something exact about the cosine of 40 degrees. We can do the same for 80 degrees and 160 degrees. When we triple them, the resulting cosines are also negative one-half. So the cosine of 80 degrees and the cosine of 160 degrees are roots of the same cubic. Let's draw a graph of this cubic. Its roots indeed are the cosine of 160 degrees, the cosine of 80 degrees, and the cosine of 40 degrees. That's great news. Instead of working with three crazy cosines, we can work with one nice cubic. To do so, it helps to go back and forth between the roots of a polynomial and its coefficients. For example, suppose we have three numbers, three roots, call them r, s, and t. 
What happens when we multiply x minus r by x minus s and x minus t? We get the following. For instance, the quadratic term involves the sum of the roots. The constant term involves the product of the roots. We went from the roots to the coefficients, but we can go the other way around too. The resulting equations are called Vieta's formulas. I'll give the formulas for cubics, though similar formulas hold for any polynomial. Suppose we have a cubic with roots r, s, and t. We get an equation for the sum of the roots, and an equation for the sum of the product pairs, and finally an equation for the product of the roots. These are nice formulas, giving us information about the roots. Why are they called Vieta's formulas? Francois Viet was a French mathematician from the 1500s. He published in Latin, where his name was written Vieta. Besides his specific formulas for polynomials, he developed a new way of doing algebra. For centuries prior, an algebra problem would be a bunch of words, with the solution also a bunch of words. Later, symbolic algebra was started by some Arabic mathematicians, and developed fully by Viet. Here an algebra problem would be written with symbols, with the solution also in symbols. This gave a much shorter way of doing algebra. As a thought experiment, Imagine for this video we couldn't use such symbolic notation, but could use only words. It would be a nightmare. Back to Vieta's formulas. What do his formulas say for our specific cubic? Remember that the cosines of our angles are the roots of this cubic. The cubic is missing a quadratic term, but we can always add in 0x squared. Vieta's formulas give these three equations. For example, the sum of the cosines is 0. The product of the cosines is negative one eighth. Let's check whether these equations are reasonable. Here are the decimal approximations from before. When we add them, the sum seems to be zero. When we multiply, the product seems to be negative one eighth. We've made good progress. We know the sum of the cosines. But what about the sum of the cube roots of the cosines? We have a polynomial whose roots are the cosines. Can we come up with another polynomial? whose roots are the cube roots of those cosines? More generally, can we transform any polynomial so that its new roots are the cube roots of the original roots? That will be our goal. Instead of heading directly toward that goal, we'll reverse the process. Can we transform a polynomial so that its new roots are the cubes of the original roots? If so, then we can run the process backward to come up with the cube roots. Cubing the roots is still not easy, so let's work our way up. We'll first try to square the roots. We have a polynomial, say a cubic, with roots r, s, and t. Can we find another cubic with roots r squared, s squared, and t squared? Because r, s, and t are roots, they obey this cubic equation. To say something about r squared, s squared, and t squared, we'd like every term to have even degree. So let's separate the odd degree terms from the even degree terms. How can we make every term have even degree? Let's square both sides. Next we'll expand and bring everything to one side. We have a six degree polynomial whose terms have even degree with roots r, s, and t. I claim that this cubic polynomial has roots r squared, s squared, and t squared. Why? Let's go back to the top part. What does it mean for this equation to be true for r? It means we can replace x with r. That's what's shown in red. Now let's go back to the bottom. To check whether this equation is true for r squared, let's replace x with r squared. We get this second red equation. How do the two red equations compare? They're equivalent. For instance, r squared cubed is r to the sixth, and r squared squared is r to the fourth. Since the top red equation is true, so is the bottom red equation. The same logic works for s squared and t squared. Let's summarize. We started with a cubic whose roots are r, s, and t. We transformed it into this other cubic with roots r squared, s squared, and t squared. We've squared the roots. As an example, remember this cubic has roots that are the cosines of 40 degrees, 80 degrees, and 160 degrees, with these coefficients a, b, and c. How do we find a cubic whose roots are the squares of those cosines? We can apply the previous procedure to get this new cubic. That was for squaring the roots, but what about cubing the roots? 
We have a cubic with roots r, s, and t. Can we find another cubic with roots r cubed, s cubed, and t cubed? Let's start with our original cubic equation. To say something about r cubed, s cubed, and t cubed, we'd like every term to have degree a multiple of 3. So let's separate the terms with degree a multiple of 3 from the other terms. How can we make every term have degree a multiple of 3? Let's cube both sides. Next we'll expand. We're getting close, but there are unwanted terms of degree 4 and 5. Let's combine them. We have this annoying part ax squared plus bx. Have we seen that before? Oh yeah, near the beginning. Let's replace it and bring everything to one side. We have a ninth degree polynomial whose terms have degrees that are multiples of 3 with roots r, s, and t. As we did with squaring, we can convert this polynomial to a cubic whose roots are r cubed, s cubed, and t cubed. We've completed our goal. Let's summarize. We started with a cubic whose roots are r, s, and t. We transformed it into this other cubic whose roots are r cubed, s cubed, and t cubed. We've cubed the roots. One subtle point. Our argument assumed that r, s, and t are different. That's fine for our application because our three cosines are different, but this cubing result is true even without that assumption by changing the argument slightly. As an example of cubing the roots, we have this cubic whose roots are the cosines of 40 degrees, 80 degrees, and 160 degrees with these coefficients a, b, and c. How do we find a cubic whose roots are the cubes of these cosines? We can apply the previous procedure to get this new cubic. That process was for cubing the roots, but in Ramanujan's problem, we want to take the cube roots of the roots. So we'll reverse the process. Let's go back to the cosines. We'd like a cube because three roots are the cube roots of the cosine of 40, 80, and 160 degrees. How can we find these real numbers a, b, and c? By what we just did, we know that this other cubic has roots that are the cosines themselves. On the other hand, we already figured out way earlier this specific cubic whose roots are the cosines. So we can equate the coefficients of these two cubics. We get the following system of three equations. Our goal is to solve for the real numbers a, b, and c. Which variable is easiest to solve for? It's c. We find that c is one half. We can substitute its value into the other equations. Now we have two unknowns. How shall we solve for a and b? Let's place a cubed and b cubed on the left. We can then multiply the two equations together. We get the following. Expanding gives this. Let's rewrite that final equation. It looks like a and b always appear together. So let's give a name to the product a, b. We'll call it p for product. Then our equation becomes this. Moving to one side gives this. It's a cubic equation in one unknown p. How can we solve it? There is a cubic formula, but it's complicated and not needed here. Instead, let's revisit a technique we know for quadratic equations. Suppose we have to solve this quadratic. Pretend we don't know the quadratic formula. We can complete the square. On the side, we'll square x minus 2 fifths. We chose 2 fifths because it's half of the 4 fifths. When we square, we get this. It looks pretty close to our original quadratic. So our quadratic simplifies, and now we can solve. In the same way, we could derive the general quadratic formula. Shall we try a similar idea on our cubic? We have this cubic in P. Instead of completing the square, we'll complete the cube. On the side, let's cube P minus 3 halves. We chose 3 halves because it's 1 third of the 9 halves. When we expand, we get this. As expected, the cubic and quadratic terms match up with the original. What's surprising is that the linear terms also match up. I guess that's part of the Ramanujan magic. Anyway, we can simplify our original cubic. p appears just once, so this equation is easy to solve. Here's the value of p. It's 3 minus the cube root of 9 all over 2. Now we can go back to our previous equations. Remember that p is the product a, b. We had these two equations for a and b. Now that we know a, b, 
we can solve for a and b individually. We get these expressions, cube roots inside cube roots. Let's summarize. We wanted a cubic whose roots are the cube roots of our cosines, and now we found its coefficients, a, b, and c. Ramanujan's problem asked for the sum of the cube roots. By Vieta's formulas, the sum of the roots is negative a. So here's our final answer. It's a cube root. Inside the cube root is 3 times the cube root of 9 minus 6 over 2. We've solved the problem. Let's make sure our answer is reasonable. Remember we calculated that the sum of the cube roots is about 0.49. And indeed our final expression is about 0.49. Our answer agrees with the calculator to 10 decimal places. We can also look at the original problem in the Journal of the Indian Math Society. In the second part, we see that our answer is the same. As an aside, I encourage you to try the first part of Ramanujan's problem on your own. We can also check our answer with Ramanujan's notes. On this page of his notebooks, we see Ramanujan's answer in his own handwriting. It matches our answer. By the way, his next line looks at the same problem, but with secant replacing cosine. I find it inspiring to read through Ramanujan's notebooks. At MIT, we have a bust of Ramanujan. While walking by it, I sometimes think of the following quote, What Mozart was to music and Einstein was to physics, Ramanujan was to math. I hope you enjoyed this problem from the Mozart of math. Thanks for watching!